Okay, okay. I'm starting this recording for the Johto re-ranking stuff, but Churro is purring really loudly, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and record it. Uh, here, here is Churro. Isn't that just the cutest thing ever? These are all runs that I did over the past couple months on streams, so you may have seen them already. Due to time limitations with all of my other projects and my ambitious goal of beating every Pokemon game with every species, I haven't done any additional runs behind the scenes with any of these Pokemon. So if you're up to date with all of my streams, you will already know all of the results. Well, with one exception. But for those of you who don't watch my live content, this is a chance for you to get caught up. And for those of you that just watch everything I do, thank you so much. It really means a lot to me. By the way, in this video, all of the playthroughs that I will be showing are the most recent attempt that I have done with that Pokemon. That is, assuming that the most recent attempt was the best result that I've achieved, and for all of the Pokemon included in this video, that is the case. I say that just because I'm sure in the future there will be a time when my most recent attempt isn't my best. Okay, kicking things off, I'm going to describe the structure of this video because it's going to be a little bit different than my regular format. I'm going to first talk about why the Pokemon needed to be re-ranked, then second, I will discuss the major strategical changes I made to improve its results, and finally I will talk about its ranking and we'll see where it is now placed in the tier list. For reference, this is the tier list with the Pokemon ranked as they were before these runs, so now let's talk about Quillfish. As a Pokemon, it is surprisingly decent, 65 HP, 95 attack, 75 defense, 85 speed, and 55 special attack and special defense. But that's where the good stuff stops. Its level up learn set is quite frankly terrible. It starts with spikes, tackle, and poison sting, and then through level up gets harden, minimize, water gun, pin missile, takedown, and hydro pump. By the way, just so you're aware, Spikes is a crystal exclusive, so if I was playing Gold and Silver, I wouldn't have access to it. Through TM and HM, things were a little bit better. It gets the three normal type moves, as well as Sludge Bomb and a bunch of Ice coverage. If you're a little bit confused why I'm going to run Hidden Power Ice when it can already learn Blizzard, Icy Wind, and Ice Beam, the reason's pretty simple. Icy Wind is kind of trash, Blizzard has terrible accuracy, and Ice Beam is only obtainable after I defeat Lance. Plus, Hidden Power Ice has the least negative impact on all of your DVs, so I'm going to have 15 in HP, 15 in attack, and 13 in defense. The reason Quillfish needed to be re-ranked is because the old run I have uploaded on my channel is when I was playing Gold version, which was so long ago, and I played the game on 3 times speed back then, so the results just aren't comparable. As the early game footage plays out, I want to tell you a little story of how the stream went when I played this run. It was quite frankly a disaster. It is one of my only 5 hour streams, and I was so exhausted by the end of it. I had tech problems problems, which is kind of standard fare for my streams, but Quillfish was also not a great Pokemon to use in a solo challenge. I made it to red, just over the 1 hour and 30 mark, and then I struggled against him getting a total of 8 resets, plus I needed to backtrack to the league to do additional training, wasting more time. So in its first run on stream, I clocked in with a time of 1 hour, 41 minutes, and 32 seconds, which is quite frankly a dismal performance for Generation 2. The reason it struggled so much against red is because of its damage range against the SP. On. So here's the summary for the red battle, and at my final level of 74, I have a 59.3% chance to one-hit the Psychic type. And the bad news there is that Espeon has the exact same chance to one-hit Quillfish. Since Pikachu is super effective against Quillfish and I can one-hit it with Sludge Bomb, I don't want to be setting up Curse earlier in the battle, plus then the Espeon just gets a chance to attack for free. Essentially, Quillfish is forced into using Sludge Bomb right away on its first two turns in battle, and I'm just hoping that I'm going to knock the Espeon out. If I want a better chance at that happening right away, then I would need to level up more. At level 75, I have roughly an 81% chance to knock the Espeon out, so that would be a good solution. However, I felt it was just going to lose Quillfish way too much time. Of course, chat helped me realize what the solution was, and I decided to go into this battle against Red at level 68, because I can outspeed the Espeon at that level. This cuts the need for a bunch of additional training, but I need a way to defeat the Psychic type. So the strategy that we came up with was to use headbutt to cause a flinch and then knock it out with sludge bomb on the second turn. So I essentially have a 30% chance to get by the Espeon and move on to the Snorlax. From that point the battle gets much easier and I've basically won. Okay so here's the state of things going into the red battle. In the blue split I was ahead by 11 minutes and 37 seconds when compared to my first run. My moveset is sludge bomb, rest, headbutt, and curse and I have one reset which happened during the second rival battle in Azalea Town. Quillfish is level 68, it has enough speed to move first against all of Red's Pokemon on, so now let's see these battles. The first thing you need to know is that because Quillfish is at a lower level, Espeon is always going to one-hit with Psychic, so if I don't get a flinch, I need to reset.
that. Okay, so are you ready for one of the most painful things that has ever happened to me in the history of this channel? Yeah, let's go through it. Battle number one, no flinch. Battle number two, no flinch. Battle number three, no flinch. Battle number four, no flinch. Battle number five, no flinch. Battle number six, no flinch. Battle number seven, no flinch. Battle number eight, no flinch. Battle number nine, no flinch. Battle number ten, no flinch. Honestly, around here, I was starting to think, does Headbutt not have a chance to flinch for some reason? I don't know, is there some interaction that I'm not aware of that is preventing this secondary effect? And no, there isn't. I am just getting extremely unlucky. I was, of course, concerned that I was on the wrong RNG seat or something like that, so I was trying to mess with these factors as I continued to attempt. And yeah, I get a total of 18 resets here before finally I flinch the Espeon and knock it out. Okay, so let's do a little bit of probability math. If the chance that I don't flinch the Espeon is 70%, then we can take 0.7 and raise it to the power of 18. This gives me a result of 0.001628. I got the 0.16% chance that I don't get one flinch. That means Quillfish is unfortunately going to be ranked based on an extreme outlier result. Defeating Red, it gets a final time of 1 hour 24 minutes and 1 second. With 19 resets at level 69, uh, not really nice. With a game time of 5 hours and 11 minutes. By the way, if you watch the stream VODs, you may notice a small discrepancy in the final times that I'm reporting in this video. That is because I re-recorded all of these runs using an input replay file. I'm going to be going off of the re-recorded results just because it's a little bit more accurate for a few reasons that I don't have time to go into now. Quillfish wasn't ranked on the tier list before because it's results were on three times speed, so now with these new results it earns itself a spot in the B tier just behind Gengar and ahead of Dragonite. If you're curious of the details for the rest of the run, go and check out the stream VOD, but I'll provide this little graphic as a short summary of what I did in the playthrough for all of you that don't want to watch a five hour video. Okay, so there are more water types in this video, but we're not going to get to them right away. Let's change things up and look at an ice type. Sneasel is quite frankly an awful Pokemon in Generation 2. That's because its base stats are complete trash. It has 55 HP, 95 attack, 55 defense, 115 speed, 35 special attack, and 75 special defense. Now I emphasize the special attack because the dark and the ice type both deal special damage. Luckily for us, uh, there are good normal type moves in Generation 2, so I'm going to be relying on those. It starts with Scratch and Leer, and then through level up it gets Quick Attack, Screech, Faint Attack, remember this is special. Fury Swipes, Agility, just so you can be faster than you already are. Slash, Beat Up, which is kind of trash in the solo run. I don't have time to go into it, just look it up, it's a terrible move in this format. And finally Metal Claw, which by the way is a crystal exclusive, and essentially useless because it comes at level 65. Sneasel does have some things going for it, the fact that it has a medium slow growth rate, and it has a decent TM and HM learn set. Like I mentioned, it has the normal moves, but it also gets things like Dig and Shadow Ball, which in Generation 2 is physical. Ice Punch is of course usable, it has high base power, plus it has the same type attack bonus even though Sneasel's special attack is so low. The reason this one needs to be redone is because it was my first ever Crystal playthrough, and yes, I was playing on 3x speed back then as well. Surprisingly, in its first run, Sneasel got a better time when compared with Quillfish. I ended the game at 1 hour, 37 minutes, and 49 seconds. So that's the time I'm chasing down with this second attempt. The majority of my planning was focused on beating Bruno, because his Machamp is very bulky and cross chop hits like a truck. Of course, I also have to contend with Chuck in the mid game, and that's what eventually led me to choose Hidden Power Flying. Sneasel gets Dig, which helps against Morty. Hidden Power Flying can now be used to counter Chuck. Dig and Ice Punch manage Jasmine, and from there things are straightforward until I get to the league. My target level for Bruno is 63. This ensures that Hidden Power Flying one shots the Machamp. By the way, if you're curious if Return with the Pink Bow would one shot the Machamp, uh, no, it won't. Here are the damage ranges. This is Return with the Pink bow compared with Hidden Power Flying without any held item. When I played Tyranitar in the past, which will also have to be included in one of these re-ranking videos in the near future, I also found that it was good running Hidden Power Flying because it's one, physical, and two, it helps you counter fighting types. There is a downside of course because Hidden Power Flying does not have great DVs, 7 HP, 12 attack, and 13 defense. In my mind, it's an option if you really need it for fighting types, but if you don't, something else is going to be better. Probably Hidden Power Ice. My first reset in this run was purely player error. I used Dig against the Arcanine rather than just attacking with Return, and because of that it was able to knock me out with Flamethrower. By the time I've cleared blue, Sneasel's strategy has converged to the Johto standard, which is Curse, Rest, and Return for Red. The key Pokemon here is Charizard because Red knows that it has a type advantage against my Ice type, so he's going to be going for Flamethrower 
more right away. I needed a level that would give me a good chance to knock the fire type out in two turns, as well as tank one flamethrower, and level 78 feels like the perfect balance. I have a 61% chance to two hit, and flamethrower does between 77 and 90% damage. There are two loss conditions here, number one, the Charizard gets a critical hit, or number two, the Charizard burns me, cutting my physical attack, which is exactly what happens in my first fight against Red. Once the Charizard is dealt with, which doesn't always happen, the Snorlax is also a problem. If Red's Charizard did maximum damage or close to it, I'm not going to survive a hit from Body Slam even if I use Curse, and I want to be able to use this move at least once before using Rest so that my defense is high enough that I can survive three hits from Snorlax while I sleep. Eventually the Charizard doesn't do enough damage, and then I can set up against the Snorlax, praying that it doesn't crit. Once this happens, I can just sweep with Return, finishing off all of Red's final Pokémon. Sneasel clocks in with a time of 1 hour 31 minutes and 59 seconds with 5 resets at level 78. This is a game time of 5 hours and 52 minutes. These results are in Sneasel a placement just behind Snorlax and Umbreon, near the top of the C tier. Here's the run summary, just in case you're curious. And in summary, Sneasel was actually pretty decent for a Pokémon. Pokemon that has so much that's working against it. I did describe it as awful, so maybe I need to apologize for that. Either way, I'm pretty happy with these results. Okay, so let's do a water type now and completely stomp the game with it. Azumarill is a fantastic Pokemon. This one needs to be re-ranked because I formerly did it, but I evolved from a Meryl at the start of the game, so that's not comparable when all the other Pokemon have started fully evolved. For base stats, it has 100 HP, so much bulk. It has 50 speed, attack, and special attack, and 80 defense and special defense. Of course, there's no abilities in Generation 2, so there's no huge power, but it'll get that in Generation 3, and it'll be even better there. It has a fast growth rate, a decent starting set, Tackle, Defense Curl, Tail Whip, and Water Gun. Beyond that, it notably gets Rollout at level 15 and Bubble Beam at 25. Through TM and HM, it gets the standard Ice type coverage you would expect from a Water type. It also gets Ice Punch, which is going to be useful because I don't need a Hidden Power for this run. So of course I went with Hidden Power Dark to ensure that my DVs are maxed. Now, you might look back through my catalog of live streams and you'll be like, Scott, you, you never did a live stream with Azumarill. Yeah, I, I know. I played this one at the end of March with a bunch of patron supporters as well as YouTube members. There's no VOD of this because we just did it over Discord for fun. By the way, we are hosting one of these every month, so if you want to support me and you want a little bit of a bonus and a chance to chat with me, come and hang out, it's really fun. Because there's no stream VOD, I'll go into a little bit more detail for this run. In the early game, you can go on minimum battles because defense Defense Curl is so fantastic at beating the first three gym leaders. I start things off with a little bit of a deficit against Faulkner being 10 seconds behind my former pace. By the way, you're going to note at the top it says for splits, Piloswine 1 and Piloswine 2. That's just completely wrong. I forgot to change the labels. Sorry about that. For Bugsy, I can utilize Defense Curl in combination with Rollout to boost its damage and sweep through the bug type trainer. The rival in Azalea Town you would think would be difficult because he does have a Bayleaf which is super effective, but since I have Rollout, out, it's not that bad, although I do just barely make it through this fight without a reset. Once again, Rollout, Defense Curl, Whitney's pretty easy. From there, in Ecritique City, I can replace Bubble Beam with Surf, and now Azumarill is just going to tear through the Johto section of the game. For Morty, I decided to go with Rollout just because it's a little bit faster in battle, but I'm not going to hold on to this move much longer. I teach Ice Punch in its place, defeat Chuck, then I pick up the Mystic Water, boosting Surf's damage even more. By the way, Water types would be even better if there was a Water type specialist in Johto because then you get a badge boost for those moves. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, water types are really good just because of Surf in this game. You get it so early. One factor in this run that's a little bit annoying is the fact that you don't have one-hit ranges on Claire's Dragonairs when using Ice Punch. She has three of them. They all love to use Thunder Wave, and I need a way to play around this, so I'm utilizing Rest for this fight. That said, it's my goal not to use this move because it does take time, and in this case I get lucky, no Thunder Waves land, so I don't need it. Before the League, I use a total of seven rare candies. This is kind of my standard location for them now, and that brings Azumarill up to level 58. If you're an outsider looking into this run, you won't really see that Azumarill is going to struggle during the league, but it used to when I wasn't using the rare candies here. In my previous playthrough, I had resets against Will, Koga, Bruno, and Karen. At level 58, that is not going to happen though. I sweep through everyone until Karen, then I get messed up here because of accuracy. There is a way to play around this using an HP up, but I'm not going to do that today. I hadn't learned that tactic before these runs. I defeat her on my second attempt, and Lance is completely trivial with Rest and Ice Punch. 
Now I'm 1 minute and 45 seconds ahead of my previous pace. This advantage only builds throughout Kanto, I guess I'm just playing it more efficiently, because by the time I defeat Blue, Azumarill is 3 minutes and 21 seconds ahead of its previous time. Okay, so late game against Red, water types don't do particularly well, because they're weak to the Pikachu, preventing them from setting up with Curse right at the beginning of the battle. This is one of the reasons ground types are so fantastic in Generation 2. They don't need to worry about the Pikachu at all, it just spams Quick Attack and they can set up for free. With Azumarill, I need to do a little bit of finessing to ensure that it's going to be able to defeat Red. First of all, I fly back to Johto, Blackthorn City specifically, so that I can use the Move Deleter to get rid of Surf. In its place, I teach Protect, and now I have the most Generation 2 moveset of all time. My strategy for Red is fairly simple. Knock the Pikachu out as soon as possible, then set up Curse, and sweep. One loss condition here is if the Pikachu's first thunder paralyzes, and that's what happens in my first battle, so I get a quick reset. But here's what happens when that doesn't occur. I knock the Pikachu out. By the way, Red really likes to use full restores on it. This is the only Pokemon he will ever use an item on, so once you take it out, he's not going to be using them anymore. His AI always selects Venusaur second, which is perfect because it sees that Solar Beam will do the most damage, so it's going to spam this move while I can alternate between Curse and Protect. This lets me fully set up. By the way, I had one mistake in there, so I did take tank a solar beam, but Azumarill's fine. Eventually, I pay back damage with return, knocking the grass type out in one hit. From there, things are much easier. I can two-shot the Espeon, but it did set up Reflect, so the Snorlax doesn't take very much damage. And I did get paralyzed. I heal this with Rest, move on to the Blastoise and Charizard, but they aren't a threat, and with that, Azumarill clocks in with a final time of 1 hour, 17 minutes, and 52 seconds, with two resets at level 74. This is a game time of 5 hours and 1 minute. With these results, Azumarill's an A-tier Pokemon, it finishes just ahead of Ho-Oh and Raikou, and just behind Charizard. Here's the run summary, in case you didn't understand that spamming Surf and Return is basically the plan for most of the game. Okay, so let's play something that isn't a water type now, we gotta alternate back and forth. And we're also going to do something that is truly awful. Like I said Sneasel was awful, no no no, Sneasel's not awful, Sneasel's okay. And maybe awful isn't even the right word, I think this Pokemon is truly horrendous. I played the game with Yanma, and uh, I did not enjoy it. This is my second time running this thing, I did it before when my rules were different and I played on 3 times speed, plus when I was producing the old video I made a major production error. If you didn't know, when I first started making these videos I would record each run over multiple days. Kind of how you would do a regular casual Pokemon playthrough. Because I only had one computer and it was a laptop that I used for school at the time I was doing my master's degree, I would have to close all my software and then restart it every time I came back to filming, so I forgot to set the timer to the correct value, and there's sort of an hour of time that just disappears in the middle of the run. I guess this uh, had the secondary effect of making me think that Yanma was at least decent, it felt better than I thought it was, but coming back to it I did not get the luxury of a mistake like this. Okay, so let's go through what makes it a Pokemon, for base stats it has 65 HP and attack, 45 defense, 95 speed, so at least I'll be moving first, 75 special attack, which is hilarious, and 45 special defense. The reason its special attack is hilarious is because it only learns two special moves in Generation 2, Giga Drain and Solar Beam. Why did they do that to Yanma? Also, Wing Attack, which is a level up move, is a crystal exclusive, so if you got this thing in gold and silver when it originally was released, it was basically one of the worst Pokemon out there. Today I decided to go with Hidden Power Ice to try to get a little bit more special damage throughout the playthrough, I figured this could accelerate me, plus this is, as I've mentioned before a million times, it is the best hidden power typing. Don't argue with me, it's just an objective truth. So you know how I said before I don't get the luxury of my mistake from last time? Uh, this time I get the, uh, like, I don't know, It's what's the opposite of luxury? Like, complete annoyance of my mistake in choosing hidden power ice. It's theoretically the best, but it's definitely not the right fit for Yanma. Okay, here's a fun fact. Yanma has no way to attack the rival's ghost in Azalea Town, so I have to use foresight to detect it so that I can attack it with normal type moves. By the way, just so everyone knows, this move cannot be used in the opposite way, so if you're a ghost type and you use foresight on a normal type, you cannot hit it with ghost type moves. It only allows fighting type and normal type moves to hit ghosts. Now if you really want to see my suffering, please go and check out the whole stream, but I'm not going to get into all of that. In general, Yanma is just having to use moves like Headbutt and Swift throughout the majority of this playthrough. It gets Hidden Power Ice for the mid-game, but that still doesn't prevent it from getting a bunch of resets. We're going to jump ahead now 
now to Lance because Hidden Power Ice should give me an easy solution to his team. And it is of course able to one-hit the Dragonites, but the true problem is the Aerodactyl, which can survive and use Rock Slide doing four times damage to Yanma. Actually, it's not only the Aerodactyl because also the Charizard can deal massive damage with Flamethrower. And this Pokemon is going to cause way more problems when I have to go up against Red. Just so everyone's aware, I'm defeating Blue around the 1 hour and 55 minute mark. I have 18 resets and Yanma is level 70. Using Rare Candies, I bring it up to level 78 before facing Red, and then I go into the fight with a kind of standard moveset, Wing Attack Return, Rest, and Curse. The problem here is, as soon as I defeat the Pikachu, he sends in Charizard, and it just goes for Flamethrower after surviving Return, with more than half health I will note, and it one-shots Yanma. Okay, I really have to prepare everyone for what you're about to witness, because yeah, it's, it's not good. Here's a montage of a bunch of the losses that I had against Red. We are going to show you the time that the opponent Pokemon knocks me out, because if I showed you every single fight, we would be here for over an hour. You might ask the question, why don't you just go and level more and then fight Red? Well, honestly, I got really stubborn and frustrated by this point. I was not having a good time, and because of that, I leaned into Yanma and I just doubled down trying to beat Red at this level. This is a mistake, by the way. It's called the sunken cost fallacy, and I probably would have been better just restarting the run and switching my hidden power typing. If I had a rock type move, this battle wouldn't be nearly as challenging and I could just one-shot the Charizard. But no, I uh, I didn't do that. I did try different strategies though, so I'll give myself that. I'm going for headbutt, hoping for flinches, but the Charizard takes so little damage that I'm going to have to get multiple flinches in a row or critical hits. I utilized a swagger strategy in combination with headbutt to try to defeat the Charizard. This didn't end up working. I figured maybe I should keep return and drop curse because I'm not really able to set up with it when his first two Pokemon are electric and fire types. Eventually in the end, I decided on headbutt, return, rest, and swagger with a pink bow as my held item. And yeah, I have um, 87 resets at this point and Finally, at long last, I take the Charizard out due to self-inflicted confusion damage. Now, I've skipped over so much of the pain here. Blastoise also needs to hit itself because it knows Blizzard. So, when that happens, I finally make it through all of Red's team and clock in with a final time of 2 hours, 28 minutes, and 51 seconds. With 87 resets at level 78. This is a game time of 7 hours and 19 minutes. I didn't have it in me at the time to do another run with Yanma on stream, so I conclude with the hopes of doing another one behind the scenes with Hidden Power Rock. But I'll admit, I have not got around to it yet, so we're just going to rank it based on this time for now. I think in the future when I come back to it, it will be possible to get it under two hours, but not today. With this time, it earns itself a spot at the end of the Lieutenant Surge tier, and I will admit, just barely. It was almost over two hours and 30 minutes. Here's the run summary, in case you want to inflict this pain on yourself, I do not recommend it. I want to get away from this thing as fast as possible, so now let's do an another water type Pokemon that's actually pretty decent and it has a really cool design. Octillery is awesome. It has 75 HP, defense, and special defense, 45 speed, but 105 attack and special attack. It starts with Water Gun, learns Constrict, the worst move of all time at level 11, and then at level 22 it learns three beams, Psy Beam, Aurora Beam, and Bubble Beam. At level 25 it gets its signature move, Octazooka, and it also gets Ice Beam at level 54. If you want style points, you can teach it Flamethrower from the Move Tutor after Lance, but I'm not going to be utilizing that in today's run. Unlike Azumarill, I am going to give Octillery a bespoke hidden power typing, and this is one I don't think I've ever used before, Hidden Power Electric. This one causes me to lose 8 points in my HP DV because my attack DV is 14. This thing is essentially just a cannon, it's not really a glass cannon, it has okay defenses, but it's quite slow. Still, I thought it was going to hold up very well against the Pokemon in the game, and I ended up being right. Like Azumarill, this one's being re-ranked for the same reason, I started as Remoraid and evolved throughout the playthrough. Of course, I'm going to do re-ranks with both Mer and Remoraid at some point in the future. The first reset comes in Azalea Town because the rival has Bayleaf, and that does make sense. This is generally one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, fight in Johto. That said, from there, things get so much easier because by the time I reach Goldenrod City, my moveset is sort of stacked. Bubble Beam, Aurora Beam, Swift, and Psy Beam. In my first playthrough, I found that the last of these is basically useless, so I put Hidden Power Electric in its place. Okay, let's jump way ahead. Before the League, I use a total of six rare candies, 
bringing Octillery up to level 55, and now it has Ice Beam for the next 5 trainers. It's really refreshing in a Generation 2 playthrough to have this move before the Elite Four, that so rarely happens. Karen with her accuracy lowering shenanigans does not cause a reset for Octillery, so that's really convenient. And of course for Lance I have Electric and Ice moves, so yeah, he's easy. Kanto happens, I keep my offensive set for Blue, he's not a challenge. But before Red I'm going to switch things up, I'm going to teach Curse as well as Protect. Note, I did not get rid of Surf because I didn't want to spend the time backtracking. All I need is the three bottom moves, I don't actually need any water type damage. Octillery can one shot the Pikachu and then like Azumarill set up against the Venusaur which Red sends in next. This seems to be the optimal way to play water types. From there Red's team doesn't really stand a chance. The Blastoise actually does do a lot of damage but I resist hits from the Charizard and I can stall it out using Protect. This allows Octillery to get a time of 1 hour, 17 minutes and 33 seconds, with one reset at level 71. This is a game time of 5 hours and 2 minutes. It ended up performing a little bit better than Azumarill because of its type coverage as well as its offensive stats. But it wasn't so significantly better to get into the S tier. Right now it has a time slower than Ampharos and slightly faster than Charizard. If you're one of the viewers that listens along in the background and you want to see the run summary, here it is. Okay, now let's keep things slow, actually so slow that this water is going to freeze over and become ice. Piloswine. Uh, it's actually faster than Octillery, which I find hilarious. This thing looks like it would be one of the slowest Pokemon in existence. For base stats, it has 100 HP and 100 attack, 80 defense, 50 speed, and 60 special attack and special defense. Unfortunately for Piloswine, it has a slow growth rate. Luckily though, it does get Horn Attack and Powder Snow at the beginning, which are decent starting moves. Through level up, it gets Endure, Takedown, Fury Attack, Mist, Blizzard, and Amnesia. I got comments about why I didn't teach Piloswine dig in my last video and the, the answer is it just can't learn it. It's so frustrating. Anyways, I'm going to calm down because this run was actually quite fun to play on stream because I was able to use a move that I have never used before on the channel. Anytime this happens I get a little bit excited but I was especially excited for this find. Now in brief let me tell you the story of the stream. I played my first playthrough, everything was kind of normal, we optimized, I went into my second run and then I got stuck at will having way too many resets. I didn't fall victim to the sunk cost fallacy here, I just restarted the playthrough because I knew that I would get better results if I had a different strategy. And here is how it plays out for Piloswine. Powder Snow defeats Faulkner, then teach Mudslap for same type attack bonus damage. I wanted to describe my Whitney strategy because she's a little bit tricky. I'm using the Quick Claw to hopefully move first against the Mill Tank and Mudslap to blind it to break Rollout's combo. It turns out this wasn't good enough and she gets lucky once, giving me a reset. Chuck can occasionally give out resets, he's kind of like the Surge of Generation 2. He puts Piloswine to sleep, lands two dynamic punches, so that's one more than my Bitterberry could compensate for, and as a result, Piloswine knocks itself out. This fight is always just faster if you take the reset and try again. He's so inconsistent, eventually you're gonna luck through. Jasmine is similarly inconsistent because Iron Tail is a really inaccurate move, but also Piloswine is inconsistent here because it doesn't have a consistent damage roll with Hidden Power Ground on the Steelix. If I don't get the damage I need, then it's gonna two shot Piloswine, which is what happens in my first fight against her. In the second one I get a critical hit and defeat her that way. If I came back to do another Piloswine run, I would definitely try to optimize this fight a little bit better. If it seems like this Piloswine run is getting a little bit sloppy, it definitely is. At the time of recording, the Piloswine stream is the longest one on my entire channel, with a length of 5 hours 18 minutes and 13 seconds. After the one failed run, I was definitely getting quite tired. For that reason, when the rival in the underground beats me, teleporting me back to before petrol, I decided not to restart or reset and just complete the run. Okay, so now let's talk about the fun thing that I discovered for this run. At level 42, Piloswine can learn Mist in the place of Mudslap. Then I upgrade Headbutt to Return, Powder Snow to Icy Wind, and Hidden Power Ground to Earthquake. In my second playthrough on stream, I went into the Will fight under-leveled, meaning I couldn't outspeed the Zatu, but at level 48, I move first against it so it can't do awful things like Confuse Me with Confuse Ray. If you're worried about Bruno, don't be, I can survive both a Mock Punch as well as a Cross Chop as long as it doesn't crit and knock his ace out. Even with all the bumps, this puts Piloswine ahead of its former time by 6 minutes and 26 seconds. Okay, so are you ready for the miss strategy? Against Karen, I can use this move on the first turn to block Umbreon's sand attack. Because I was tired, I forgot to do it in the first battle, and this ends in a loss because of paralysis, but in the second battle I block the status move and then knock the Umbreon out. From there, I do get paralyzed, but I have a paralyzed cure berry for the Vile Plume, which lets me take it out and sweep the remaining team members after barely surviving Houndoom's flamethrower. 
Lance is pretty rough for Piloswine because the final Dragonite has Fire Blast, the Aerodactyl has Rock Slide, and the Charizard has Flamethrower. These Pokemon all have decent speed stats, and while Piloswine does outspeed the Dragonite, the Charizard and the Aerodactyl will move first. I also didn't know exactly the level I needed here because he survives some damage ranges that I didn't think he should. It turns out at level 53, it's just more consistent for Piloswine, and that gives me the victory. Now I said this when I made my yellow re-ranking video, I think there are going to be some Pokemon that constantly make it into these videos trying to get better times. Piloswine is probably my number one pick for Johto Pokemon because I really want to redo this run. I'm really not proud of my play here or how well this was optimized. And the flaws in the run continue because against Blue I was unaware that his AI isn't always going to pick a Rain Dance when he sends in Gyarados. I was relying on this mechanic to have enough health left over to survive Arcanine's Flamethrower, but if the Gyarados uses Hydro Pump he is going to defeat me. So I take two more resets here for a total of 10, but at least I'm still ahead of my former playthrough by 6 minutes and 44 seconds. Okay, red is fairly simple. I level up to 62, and then I use 8 rare candies, bringing Piloswine up to level 70 where I can learn Amnesia. This means I can utilize Amnesia and Curse with Rest to basically be invincible unless he crits. From there I can sweep his team and clock in with my final time of 1 hour 33 minutes and 32 seconds. This is 7 minutes and 35 seconds ahead of the first Piloswine run, and for now, it's the time it's going to be ranked with. With the bad optimization, it earns a spot just behind Sneasel in the C tier. I think with more optimization, it's going to overtake Sneasel, but probably not significantly so. A lot of things are working against this thing in a solo challenge format. Okay, so now let's move on to the channel mascot and see how it's able to do in Pokemon Crystal. Venomoth is being re-ranked because I evolved it from Venonat, and that really impacted its time because Venonat is genuinely so bad in the early game. It has higher attack, but it gets special moves, and then finally once it evolves at level 33, it becomes half decent. Whenever I give one of these value judgments about how a Pokemon is, I'm talking about how it performs in a solo challenge. After all, Venomoth is aesthetic perfection. In my previous video with it, I forgot Sludge Bomb, so here today, I am seeking redemption for that mistake. Mistake. That is the second more emotional reason for this re-ranking. Venomoth's stats are nothing special, 70 HP, 65 attack, 60 defense, 90 speed and special attack, and 75 special defense. I've identified two factors that hold Venomoth back from a good performance in Pokemon Crystal. The first is the fact that sleep was nerfed in Generation 2 so that Pokemon can attack on the turn that they wake up. Overall this is a healthy thing for the series, but it really does hold back sleep powder users. Believe me when I say Venomoth is not the Pokemon that's going to most fall from grace, going from generation 1 into generation 2. So this Pokemon really takes a while to build momentum. By the time I'm going up against Claire, my moveset has matured, and now it features Sludge Bomb, Hidden Power Ice, Sleep Powder, and Psy Beam. The last of these moves can be replaced with Psychic when Venomoth learns it through level up. You know, all the other Psychic types in generation 2 don't really learn this move through level up, so it's nice they gave it to Venomoth. By the way, if you're really paying attention, I am trying to learn the art of subtlety. Going up against Blue, I haven't changed my moveset, I can just get through him with raw damage, but for red I do need to make one key adjustment. I'm going to teach Protect in the place of Hidden Power Ice. Sludge Bomb one-shots the Pikachu, next is Snorlax, I'm going to put it to sleep to force it to use moves like Snore which don't do much damage. If it wakes up and paralyzes me, I'm just going to reset right away, which is what happens in my first battle. What I want to have happen is the Snorlax stay asleep so that I can knock it out with three uses of Sludge Bomb. From there, red sends in Venusaur, uh, I don't know why, it seems like the worst possible next choice. I knock it out using Sludge Bomb, use Sleep Powder on the Charizard, which I can then two hit with a combination of Psychic as well as Sludge Bomb. From there we need to keep using the sleep inducing move to put Espeon as well as Blastoise to sleep, and Venomoth clocks in with its time of 1 hour 33 minutes and 9 seconds, with two resets at level 73. This is a game time of 5 hours and 58 minutes. And I ended up a total of 14 minutes and 53 seconds ahead of my first playthrough on the stream. That's a pretty big improvement and I'm quite happy with it. These results put Venomoth just between Sneasel and Piloswine in the tier list. We have almost made it through all of the Pokemon that I'm going to re-rank, but 2024 is the year of the normal type in Crystal, and so fittingly we are going to end with one and see if it can achieve epic results.
Apom is objectively not a very good Pokemon when you consider its base stats. It has 55 HP, defense and special defense, 70 attack, 85 speed, and 40 special attack. But its base stats are essentially the only thing that's bad about it in Generation 2. It has a fast growth rate, so it's going to gain levels very quickly. It starts with the same type attack bonus move that has 100% accuracy in Scratch. And then while it doesn't get anything useful through level up, it does get access to a wide range of TMs. All four of the punches despite not having fists on its arms. I know its tail technically has one, but I don't think it punches with that. It also gets access to some physical moves like Shadow Ball, Mud Slap, and Fury Cutter for coverage, as well as the three powerful normal type moves. I'm re-ranking this one because it was played on three times speed. If you doubt Apom's abilities in this game, I am about to put those doubts to rest because Apom is great in Crystal. Faulkner's easy because I have Scratch. Bugsy's easy because Apom has enough speed, and it can learn Swift from Union Cave. The rival outside of Azalea Town doesn't stop me today, although there is the possibility of losing here if the Ghastly gets lucky with something like Spite. Passing through the forest, I get access to Headbutt, and then in Goldenrod City, I can teach both Ice Punch and Fire Punch. These moves are a little bit of a trap for Apom. You don't want to just be using them when they're super effective. There are three scenarios I think they're useful in. Number one, if the Pokemon takes four times damage from the move. Number two, if the Pokemon has extremely low special defense. And number three, if Apom's other moves are resisted. For Whitney, Apom has enough speed to move first against the mill tank so it can flinch with headbutt, basically making rollout much less effective. My hidden power choice in this run is hidden power dark, and that's not just for perfect DVs. It's also so I can use this move against Pokemon like the rival's Haunter as well as Morty's team. You might be wondering why I'm not using hidden power ground or perhaps even hidden power ghost. The answer is fairly simple, hidden power dark just does well enough and I don't want to sacrifice any DVs. For the red Gyarados I teach thunder punch in the place of hidden power dark and now I have the elemental punches and return. This is peak generation 2 genericness, and it carries Apom all the way until I arrive at Karen. Shadow Ball in the place of Fire Punch gives me better damage against the Gengar, making the fight just a little bit more consistent. Ice and Electric moves together are perfect for the champion, so Apom gets a sub hour lance split. Things were a little bit worrying at blue because the Arcanine does get a burn, but this doesn't stop Apom because I get lucky with a critical hit. For red, we convert one type of genericness into another type of genericness. Return, Curse, Rest, and Sleep Talk. It's best to play Apom knocking the Pikachu and the Espeon out as quickly as possible, utilizing Return, and then set up Curse on the Snorlax. I'm running Sleep Talk because the special moves that are thrown at you from Venusaur, Charizard, and Blastoise hit pretty hard, so I want to have the option of using Rest if I really need it. I want to mention to all of you here that we only need plus 3 setup from Curse. This will allow me to knock out all of Red's Pokemon, but it also keeps Apom outspeeding the Snorlax. That way, I'm going to have just enough health to survive the hit from Blastoise, in this case only 5 hit points to spare, and with that the normal type Monkey clocks in with an incredible time of 1 hour 16 minutes and 52 seconds, with 0 resets at level 76. This is a game time of 4 hours and 59 minutes. These results are not quite good enough to get Apom into the S tier, but it still gets a very respectful placement just behind Typhlosion and Entei in the A tier. The next one of these re-ranking videos is going to be for Pokemon Emerald because I need to fill out my second attempt tier list for that game. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much, it means the world to me. Now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.